All right, so it is uh, 3.30. Let me make sure our live stream is going. And I'm trying a, a live stream this time um, and also a recording. So uh, fingers crossed that all of this works. Um, and if it looks like everyone that's here was on the uh, intro session, but uh, just for the sake of it, I'm going to say a handful of things again. Um, it's partly to remind myself as well. Uh, so in general, um, while someone's presenting, in this case, it'll be me, I'm going to have everyone else's mic muted so that it doesn't interrupt the feed. Um, if you need to say something or you're called upon to say something, uh, make sure you unclick the muted mic button uh, so that we can hear you. I can mute you, but I can't unmute you. So that'll be that'll be your task is to unmute. Um, let's see what else. Oh, if you have a question while I'm in the middle of presenting because I'm I'm looking at about five screens <laughs> right now and also looking at the kites. Um, if you have a question, just type in the chat. It's easiest if you do it like this. If you use question marks and then say type a random question nope. like that um, that instantly draws my eye to see that there's a question somewhere in there and I'll try and answer it as quick as I can so let's see um yeah well welcome to the second official session of the we fly global kite conference a virtual kite conference and I'm hosting it here at the World Kite Museum in Long Beach, Washington. Um, yeah, and I'm really, really excited. I am a total nerd for history stuff. Uh, I, I can pretty much sit in the archives here and get really excited about things. And so I'm kind of excited I get to share some of this with you guys. Uh, some of this is general kite history. Some of it's um, somewhat specific kite history you may or may not have a connection to it, but uh, I'm kind of trying to show all sorts of different things um, to show what's here at the World Kite Museum in the archives. Um, there is a there's a lot <laughs> in the archives. Uh, if you ever come here to the museum, you only see maybe 2% of what they have at any given time. So um, uh, yeah. I'm gonna get started first. Let's see if I can show this on screen. I was uh, looking through some old photo books and came across some interesting ones, including uh, these photos of a halftime show in the kingdom, which for those of you that do not know, the kingdom was a, a sports facility in downtown Seattle. It's since been demolished, but uh, it was a very, obvious sports facility. It's where the Seattle Supersonics played. Uh, it kind of had a very special place in the hearts of the Pacific Northwest. But here at the Sonics game in the spring of 1979, Tom, Carl, and Jaka are flying their tissue paper Delta train in the middle of an NBA halftime show. So I'm not sure how well that shows. But uh, goes to show we did have kite flying <laughs> during a major sports event, and that uh, the kingdom is packed. It's it's somewhat hard to see, but uh, there is not an empty seat in the house of the whole kingdom. So, random photo there. Let's see. There was another random photo in this series before I get to a kite. Uh, also, back in spring of 1979. Um, here, Carl Brewer is with his kite, who set an indoor duration record holder for flying of nine hours and 15 minutes with kind of an airplane looking kite. Not sure. There we go. Can I try and hold steady my, so the picture is clear. Oh. All right, so there was that. Uh, let me get to one of the kites that's here uh, for the sport kite flyers out there or the uh, old school flyers out there, you'll definitely recognize these. We have um, not near mint condition because they've definitely been flown and they've seen some wear and tear, but 
<laughs> I have a traditional old Trilby stack that was made here in the USA. Uh, this one, I only pulled out the six stack. This is part of a larger 20, 25 stack. I just grabbed one section. Um, still flyable, apparently. But uh, yeah, this is... Um, how many of you guys uh, flew a Trilby? You can either put it in the chat or go ahead and pop up and unmute your mic. I'd love to see who's a Trilby flyer out there. I think Gary is getting very excited and typing. I've flown a few. Let's I flew a few back in the day, <laughs> the 80s. We did the world's record in 1984. We did 76 of them. 76 in one stack? Yep. Uh, prior to that, Bob Miletti, the maker of the the uh, trophies, they had the record was 54. We had to break that, but in the Detroit area, that's all we could get together was 76. And oh, we wow. flew the, we broke the record on tax day in 1984. And then we rebroke our record after that of 76 cuts. Did you, I, I'm guessing you did this with your kite team? Yes. Well, we were kind of almost a kite team. We were just a bunch of guys who got together flying kites. And uh, team flying really wasn't that known at that time. We did a lot of flying together. But uh, after that was when team flying took off and the convention I went to in Nashville that year, I was so surprised that everyone knew who we were because of the article and the uh, AKA and the also uh, Kite Lines magazine. I will unmute myself. Oh, no, nope. I, I got another question for you, though, uh, because you're because oh. <laughs> I got you online right now. OK, I won't. Um, is. Uh, did when you started flying with the wind jammers, did you ever fly as stacks, groups of stacks? Oh yeah, or? That's, oh yeah. There were uh, ten of us together that were flying, uh, just doing maneuvers and stuff. But when it came time to actually going out to compete, only three of us: Aaron, uh, Harris, and Nate Williams, and myself. We were the only ones that could get together and do it without asking for permission from wives and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. <laughs> All right, I noticed uh, Paul Chapman has a question about the oldest kite in the museum. Um, honestly, I'm not exactly sure. I know the kite you're referencing, the 1773 Dutch kite that happened to, I believe that was actually found in, inside someone's building when they were taking it apart. Or remodeling it, it? It was um, it was it was in Vliegerop in The Hague for a long time. But it, it had been I think it was found in Utrecht in an old building, as you said, it was under the under the stairs. And then it was it, it went to um The Hague and then Peter Lynn bought it and then it went to uh Drachen Foundation. But I don't know what's happened to it since. I believe uh, Scott Skinner still has tabs on it. He may have it in his private uh, collection of the Draken Foundation. I'll have to ask him. Um, I know that him and uh, Blake Pelton uh, were were doing videos with it a few years ago. Yeah, that's right. I just wondered if it went to the to the Kite Museum. That was all. Nope it's it's not here, um, and I'm not sure if that's been an option yet, but I will ask them and find out. And I definitely now want to know what the oldest kite is here, because I think the smallest kite is a Charlie Sodich, and it's right back here behind me in the miniature kite case, but yeah. that's a random fact that I happen to have. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty random. <laughs> hey, Jim, you have a kingdom uh, kite story? Do you yeah, want to share? So, um, so, you know, my situation was I didn't expect to become involved with kites when I lived in Seattle in the early 1980s. 
But I happened to meet a fellow named David Checkley. And then it went all up in the air after that. So we used to fly kites in the kingdom. And right behind me, I don't know if you can see my uh, video here of my room. That's a paper washi uh, kind of happy coat that was made by the same fellows that made Sugoru Taco like this one. And they came to Seattle to do a major kite exhibit that David Checkley organized in the early 1980s. I think it was 1983. And I, at the time, was executive director of the Japan America Society. So I got involved with David in kite exhibits at the Seattle Center. And, and before there was a kite museum in Washington, a lot of David's kites were stored behind the Omnimax screen at the Pacific Science Center at Seattle Center because there wasn't another place big enough to, he didn't have a place at home big enough for some of them. And I lived on Queen Anne Hill, not too far from David's house. So he would have kite flyers over to his house. We do an exhibit at the Kingdom or at, at the Seattle Center. And then they did, the Seattle Mariners invited um, David and some of his kite flyer friends to do uh, pre-game kite flies at the Kingdom. And so I was involved with host some of those Japanese kite flyers. I speak Japanese and went to college in Japan, but David would get me involved. And then, you know what he would do? He would take off and go to China and I would have to clean up the exhibit after he left town. <laughs> and that happened for several years. So finally I said, forget this. I'm going to China with David. I don't want to have to clean up the Seattle Center after this is a big mess, you know, like after they're done. And so I got to go with him to China in 1987 and had a great time. But I'm lucky enough to have a couple of things in some old, this is pre-digital. So my photos of the kingdom are in a scrapbook somewhere. And this happy coat was worn during one of those kite flies in the kingdom before a Mariners game. And uh, to top it off, we had one of the Beach Boys uh, in our booth. They were planning a pregame concert the following week. <laughs> and we had Bruce Johnson of the Beach Boys sitting in the uh, section where they had some dignitaries, including the Japanese Consul General and maybe the Community Queen or something like that. But David was always full of surprises, and I was very lucky to have gotten to know him uh, in the early 80s and then um, got involved with them. In fact, it was my sad duty to call some of his friends in Japan uh, the day after he passed away and conveyed news to David's, like uh, uh, Nishibayashi-san, uh, some of the ones that you'll see on the um, Hall of Fame. You know, I, I'd gone to the um, kite museum, um, uh, Modegi-san's uh, kite museum in Nihonbashi, and you know, and and they cried on the phone when I had to convey the news that David had passed away. So that's a long time ago. That's thirty plus years ago, and my business career took me away from kite flying for a long time. But in more recent years, I've come back to it. So thanks for letting me share that. <laughs> and this probably should be in the museum. Some of this stuff should get should go down there. Yeah, I kind of feel like, Jim, you and I are going to have a talk after this. <laughs> You'll have to let me know when you're free, because we're going to leave late morning from Portland tomorrow. If there's no flooding, we might get there by afternoon. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, Mr. Checkley, um, I, man, I was digging around in his rather extensive part of the collection that makes up the Long Beach, uh, or sorry, the World Kite Museum collection. Um, and he has a lot of traditional kites that he collected over the years going to uh, going to various countries in Asia and stuff and brought them back here. Um, and I, I don't know why, but this one rather spoke to me. Let's see if I can back it up a little and you can see it. And I'm going to go ahead and pin my camera so you can it takes up the whole screen so you can really see that but uh the reason this one stood out for me is not only all of the the hand painted graphics on it um but i feel like the this one's a, a good representation of some of the hidden treasures in the collection um it's all hand split bamboo oh that they even went and wrapped uh washi paper around very, very, very thin bamboo strips. So, this is 
cotton bridles and I'm trying not to get all tangled as I do this. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, tried splitting your own bamboo, but uh, <laughs> I've taken to trying it here in the past, oh gosh, um, what is it, maybe two years. And I've got to say, it's, it's, it's fun and it's difficult. And so I'm really impressed at how perfectly straight and thin this stuff is. Uh, is there anyone online now that has actually uh, hand split their own bamboo and maybe has a story to share? Yeah, me. Um, keep it there. Oh, OK. I'll bring it back. Hold on. Sorry, bring it back. Um, okay. the, the bones on the back are wrapped in paper. And that's very typical of the work of packing. So it it may I can't it's it's all it's all broken up, but um, it could well be from uh, from Hashimoto in in, in Tokyo. Uh, it, if anyone's good at reading, I'm not sure if you can see this. Oh. Not sure if you can see the signature at the bottom. I uh, can't. Oh, let's see if no. I can. No, I don't. C can't see it. It's, it's sort of broken up. Uh, it looks like a shiki. Yeah. yeah un a unfortunately, this one didn't have a tag on it. So it's in the bin of trying to figure out where it came from and um, some more providence behind it. So it's one of the other little side projects I have is to try and, um, yeah, <laughs> finish out the collection for the museum. Do you want to see, do you want to see an example of, of splitting bamboo? Uh, yeah, do you have, I'm going to pin your, your pin screen so everyone can see it. There you go. Does it come up? I can't see me, but yep. the knife I've got is from Korea. It's a Korean bamboo knife. So it's it's got a blade on one side. There's a, a, um, a scraping tool on it, and that, that's bamboo. And basically, you just you start a split, and you can work a, a split through. And it's it's quite uh, therapeutic. And you can keep on splitting the bamboo and thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, I've been making miniature kites in the last week. So, uh, yeah, bamboo is a great, a great thing to play with. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've been having a lot of fun um, kind of getting to feel the bamboo and, and understand it better uh, instead of just jamming the knife down into it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oop, I got all sorts of messages. Let me answer these real quick. All right. Um, <laughs> ah. uh, random photo for those of you that know Mr. Don Tabor. Let's see if I can make my photo or my screen a little bigger. Trying to focus that, sorry. But this was one of his prototypes. Is that a Hawaiian? It, it's a prototype Hawaiian. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is essentially a pre pre all of those kites. So let's see. I've got someone saying they, they're trying to join the chat and can't log in. So let's make sure that I get them that information. the joys of trying to man a whole conference by myself <laughs> is hopefully next year I can get someone to manage all of the other side of it. Um, kind of in the stunt kite family, uh, 
I have got some of Peter Powell's uh, Kite Factory, his very first like full production Kite Factory. Let's see if I can, I gotta force my camera to focus. Hold on. Come on camera, focus. It's focusing on me. Dang it. Come on. It's also an old photo, so it's having a hard time with that. See if that shows. There we go. So the original stunt kite. Let's see if I can get that better. Oop. Come on, focus. Oh man, sepia photos are not good for. <laughs> for that. All right. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, okay. So like I said, I am a total nerd for history. And uh, I especially love kites that have other usages outside of art kites. Um, so like the military kites, the meteorological kites and stuff like that. And so um, I found this photo and it says launching a meteorological kite. It's one of the first photos of a kite being launched to measure weather conditions. And that was associated with this book from the Department of Agriculture uh, report on the kite observations of 1898. And so it actually has all of the information in there of recordings that they did from original, uh, like, um, sorry, uh, putting kites up and, and getting, you know, data like on wind speed and uh, temperature and stuff like that. And I mean, it's, again, I'm a total nerd. It's tables and tables <laughs> of data. But uh, this, is, this is the stuff that went on to help us forecast and better understand um, how to predict various weather phenomenon. And so I kind of love that little connection of how kites is yet again something critical in all of our history and and our growth. So let me see chat. Um, let me catch up on these chats real quick. Uh, Brian Wilson, how much does that kite weigh? It's very light. Um, I mean, it... The book I just held up weighs more than that last kite. Uh, what is a source for bamboo knives? Does Paul, you might know? Yeah. Yeah, the, the best bamboo knives come from Asia. Um, there's a really good one that Dan Kurahashi does when he does a workshop. So if you do a workshop with Dan, he'll come, he'll put out a little knife that's been uh, made from a circular saw blade. But the Indonesians, Malaysians, Koreans, the Japanese, they all have separate blade, separate knives and you just have to try them. The key thing is, if you can see me, this, this knife is really strong and so it controls the bamboo. Um, and you can split, you can split really fine stuff with it. If you used a thin, um, just a thin modeling knife the, the blade would bend and you wouldn't be able to control the bamboo as you split it so so this sort of thing is is really good but you could use a kitchen knife i suppose if you grind it down to a chisel point okay yep um best source do you do you know of anyone um that sells them uh, <laughs> what i do is I travel around and when I see them, if I'm in, normally it's it's at a festival like the festival in Dieppe, which is cancelled, it should be this week. I'll go and see the guys from Japan. I'll go and see the guys from Korea and talk to them and wheedle with them. And then towards the end of the week, something pops up and then you take it home with you. But I'm, I'm part of the group that makes fighting cuts. So um, we're into paper and bamboo. So it's one of those where you kind of have to be in the area to get one or uh, know someone. Normally, it's a matter of knowing the people for maybe two or three years before before they open up. Nice. Okay, let's see. All right, so I saw that uh, the video was coming through a little pixelated, so hopefully I have fixed that now. Um, 
that means the live stream I thought I might be able to do won't be able to happen, which is fine because we're recording this and we can share it with people uh, later on. So um, if it's still pixelated, let me know and I'll see if I can tweak something else. So ooh, I've got more people joining. Okay, so again, uh, digging in the Checkly uh, part of the archives. Let's see if I can tilt back a little. <laughs> this is a big one. Um, it's another one of the bamboo and hand uh, painted kites. And while these are not the kind of kites I fly, I just find them very interesting. Um, it requires a lot more like hands on to me. I, the work I've done with washi paper is it's always getting stuck to my fingers. Um, I'm still kind of learning. And so for that, I actually prefer working with Icarex, another ripstop nylon, uh, just because it's easier to work with in, in my eyes. So I have a lot of respect for people that work with uh, traditional materials and natural materials. It's something I'm, I'm trying to learn. Uh, but what stood out for me on this one is, let's see if I can show it and hopefully without it being pixelated, it'll really show. Um, so, the knots in the bamboo are still in this one, but they were able to split it perfectly through the the nubs in the bamboo. You know how there's ridges and nubs in bamboo. Uh, and so the if you were to actually be here and see all of this up close and personal, you have the center spine. And if you were to take off this piece and this piece, these two spreaders, they're identical and you could actually lay them on top of the spine and match them up perfectly along with these two spreaders. Uh, so it was one piece of bamboo that was perfectly split to create all the spreaders for this kite uh, instead of using different pieces of bamboo. So yeah, mad respect uh, Paul Chapman and others that are splitting bamboo to this level. This would probably take me four or five pieces of bamboo to, to get this. Um, Mitch asked, is the bamboo tied or glued to the paper? This one, it's glued and it looks like it's been um, potentially repaired. There's even a piece of tape, scotch tape here. Um, but yeah, this one looks like it's been glued to the paper and it's not tied on the ends, but, and of course my camera is gonna have a hard time picking it up because it's such a fine detail and it's trying to focus on me. Uh, but the, the ends are notched with the line going through it, and that's the case on, on all of it. It's not actually tied to it. So let's see if I can set that one down. Okay. There we go. I got one more, one more book. Let's see if I can handle this one carefully. Uh, come on, camera, focus. Don't focus on the kite behind me. <laughs> so apparently, my camera does not like browns that, and sepia tones. That seems to be the issue. But this is a French book on kite building, and if I remember correctly, this was printed back about 1860. So let's see if I can get to the page I had. I but think, it, I think you'll find it's printed about 1908, something like that. It's by Gio. This one? This yeah. is by G-R-A-F-F-I-G-N-Y. Oh, Grappini, uh, yeah. But it's the kites in it are from about 1908. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. My French is very, very bad then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so. it's, it's very typical of the kite books that came out at the turn of the century. There was the books by Le Cornu and then The Sky, and there's a lot, a lot more. Oh, boy. I'm well, guessing you're from the kite history group, so I definitely like... Uh, I'm the early one here. Let's see. Uh, there are so this book. Um, whoever owned it did a lot of 
notations in the book. Um, and they've actually included, let's see, they've included some of their own drawings. And again, I'm sorry, this one's going to be very hard to see and pixelated, but they, they've even included models of the kites they were building that are a part of this book. Let's see, here we go. So just one of the, the many things that's included here in the, the kite museum. So we're going to wrap that one back up. Okay. Uh, all right, so, and this will be the last actual kite that I have per se, because I'm going to have to get ready for a sport kite chat that I have with Scott Davis after this. Um, uh, Teresa, you asked, um, uh-oh, my video cut out. Let's try this again. I think my battery died, so stand by while I swap out my battery. Uh, hopefully you can still hear me. Teresa, you asked uh, if the uh, exhibits rotate. They do. Um, how often they rotate is kind of dependent on the, uh, the director of the museum or demands at the museum, but they do rotate through the collection so other people or other stuff is visible. There we go. Battery swapped. So hopefully, oh, plug the next battery in. Okay. And if you haven't been into the Kite Museum in a while, they've actually changed a lot of stuff. Uh, they've rotated around a few things. They've painted and so yeah. All right. And yes, Mitch, I'll try and put my hand behind the, the small parts to show. All right, so uh, this next one is, it's the last kite, no, second to last kite I have here. Um, again, it's another uh, bamboo and paper kite. And let's see. There we go. Uh, it's actually using what looks like hemp for the bridle. It's pretty rough, unlike most of the cotton string, but you can see the structure of the kite is not only split bamboo, but it is a full piece of bamboo. It's an actual bamboo stick that hasn't been uh, split. And I believe this one, oh, let's see. So not only are the split parts tied on in some spots, but they're actually glued on with paper, binding the split bamboo to the central spine. So again, a random one I just thought was kind of interesting as I was digging through the archives. So ugh. this one is the last one I have, and I'm not going to pull the whole thing out. Um, Hopefully I can show you the photo, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of random kites here, <laughs> be it uh, sport kites or um, non-traditional kites. And so this is a, a box variant. Let's see. Let's see if I can get the glare off of there. There we go. So this one is down in the archives. Uh, it is about a 10 foot wingspan from there to there and about five foot, or it's about five foot from there to there. And it's a little extra feet here. I haven't put together with these, this back little tail piece yet, but um, it looks in decent condition and can't find any history on it. So if anyone knows what kite this is, uh, I know the World Kite Museum would be interested in finding out. So yeah. All right. Any uh, questions or comments or stories you want to share about uh, kites that you have? I'd love to hear them and I'll pin you 
after I stop stabbing myself with a safety pin. Do you want a strange one? Sure, go for it. Can you see me? Um, just a sec. Where are you? Click, click the thing on Paul. Paul Chapman. Yeah. Yep, yep. I got to scroll through the list. There we go. Okay, gotcha. This is this is old cuts. Mm -hmm. This tin was has got straps, has got clips on it, and it's got stuff inside it. And it was found in London, and it belonged to this guy who had a house, a big house. And when when he died, they cleared the house, and the the house clearance guys found a false wall, and behind the false wall. There were treasures, and this this kite has got. Sorry, this this box is full of kites. I put one up on the wall just now. Um, oh, and in, in inside the box, I don't know if you can see that now. Inside the box was this kite made of bamboo and cloth. In fact, there are three of them. And they're from Scotland. And they're hunting kites. And what they would do is they'd fly this one, there's two silk ones, they would fly that over the over the grass on the grass moors. And then there'd be two more on each side, keeping the birds together. And the, and the, the hunters would use the kites, the three kites to gather the birds to for the shooting but what's really interesting is on the if i can show you the the tail the tail says urban from pitlochry and pitlochry is where queen victoria used to go for hunting and shooting and urban was her, was her doctor so this may what this this kite may well have been a kite used by Dr. Irvin when they went out hunting grouse with Queen Victoria in about 1860. You look surprised. I I am. I am totally nerded out. That is so cool. <laughs> so the box with the other two kites was found in a, in a secret. There was a wall basically that had been blocked up and they found these things behind it. It was a house clearance guy and there's a certain amount of sort of chit chats and, and it came to me in the end. Oh, wow. Yeah, but we do look like yeah. that on, on the client history page in, in Facebook. I don't know if that's interesting or not. Uh, yes, yes, it's interesting. <laughs> Paul, that's fantastically interesting. Yeah, the, the other ones which are quite interesting, some old books. I'm really into old books. This is um, one of the first English kites from the book 16, 1635. So it's a, and it's a firework kite. You it tells you how to make it, and you coat the kite in um, uh, fireworky stuff, and you fly it up, and it it has um, sauces on crackers, sausages, bangers on the tail. Which, which go off. Um, but I've got a, a whole lot of very early books. I don't know what you, you got in the library, but there's another one about the same date in German, uh, for basically for dragon kites or bird kites. But um, yeah, but I wanted to show you that 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 bird. It's one of the three. I wasn't going to put them all together, but um, but it's it's always quite quite fun chasing stuff down like that. Did they have did they have uh, kite flyers like beaters to drive the drive yeah. toward hunters? So they had people yeah. that were kite flying beaters. Yeah, in, in in Scotland, in the castles, you'd have the, the the lord of the castle would have his own beaters and his and, and the 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 bird people. But for some reason or other, they tried out using the hunting kites that went with that. I've got quite a lot of other hunting kites, but not. I don't have. I think I'm the only one that's got a full set. And to have a full set of kites that may well have been used by Queen Victoria is, is quite something, really. 
Is, is there any interest in the British museum system? Not necessarily the British Museum itself, but I mean, there's a system of historical museums, histor history museums in England, and they not interested in having a kite section. You would think um, of a rich, rich area. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Some of the museums have got kites in. Um, I've got original Cody kites here, but I've tracked down original Cody kites in, in some of the some of the museums. But kites tend to keep, they're not part of the, the standard stuff that museums like to have. You might see the odd Japanese one or Chinese one in a museum, but our local stuff, it's, it's kid stuff really, and they don't understand it. So it, a lot of the people involved in kite history think it's better to keep the kites within the community rather than stick it in a museum where it's going to get lost. It's, it's a real problem because we're all getting older and um, we're all wondering what on earth we're going to do with the kites when we're gone. Um, I suppose. You know, yeah. my, my, it, it, this is uh, uh, hopefully a relevant parallel, but my wife is a quilter and one of the great contributions that one of her acquaintances has made. And she's convinced the, the St. Louis Museum and a museum in Chicago to include quilts as part of their standing rotating um, uh, presentations, you know, as a, as a regular room in the museum. And um, I wonder it, how we could do that with kites. There's this rich history. It is not just kid stuff, obviously. It's, kites have made all this uh, historical contribution to science and technology and to aerodynamics. And, and one wonders how we can move the uh, historians to recognize kites for what they really are, for the contribution they've made. It's it's a really difficult one. I'm I'm an aerospace engineer myself, so I understand all that. Um, I found that places like the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford has a lot of Asian, Indonesian, whatever kites, because they were collected from people in faraway countries. You know, a hundred years a hundred years ago or so. But stuff that we make that we make here in our own country that kept, tends to be dismissed so you, you it's really difficult to to know how to preserve traditional crafts from your own country and it's it's, it's like the quilting stuff um it's it, it is hard so that's that's what's good about the the world kite museum is that it is it is at least a place to um to put stuff but you've got to be selective Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm I'm super excited. I like want to come hang out in in your place and see everything you have and see what I can do to <laughs> like I don't know. I I am such a nerd. I'm like you saw my face. I'm sitting here staring at the camera open mouth, just very excited. <laughs> so, all right. I think it's um, underestimating yeah. our country as being folk craft, and, yeah. and you know it doesn't have the kind of stature that it really deserves. I think you know seeing things as folk art really is uh, derogatory, um, rather than high art or you know technological development. So I I, I really admire your uh, uh, ability to collect all of those things and your knowledge about it. I just, um, I wonder how it is that we could sort of move some of these historians off the dime and get them to see kites for what they really are. You know, I have a big museum in, in my town. I'm not sure why I necessarily have to ask you to do it in London, you know. I probably could do it. I probably could do it here in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got a museum here. I'm, I'm in Bristol in, in, in the west of England. And... Uh, at the Chinese New Year, I've, I've quite often done Chinese kites in the museum. Um, and we have old aeroplanes in the museum. It's just that the, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite difficult trying to present the technology of kites as related to, to aviation. We did it a few years ago in Badek in Nova Scotia. We had a, a two or three day symposium. A number of us went over there, gave talks at the Bell Museum. And that, that was very good. 
Um, There's a funny uh, saying. I think I've stolen it from some religious text, but they say that uh, that a um, uh, a prophet has great honor except in his own country. So that exactly. uh, kites have a ter tremendous respect, except like English kites in England and American kites in America. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. But then it's too local, so people ignore it. Hello, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Yeah, this is Jim Mockford. I have a, I, have, I put a question in the chat line because you referred to the hunting kites used in Scotland, I think it was. Do you yeah. have other examples of hunting kites in places such as Wales or Cornwall or regional areas? The, uh, there's, I've got two or three other different types of kites and they were made in London and then sold to sportsmen. I so see. the sportsmen would have gone wherever to use them um sometimes they go they, they go to india with them or wh wherever they, they they went so um no but some of those are quite interesting they, they're generally silk um and yes yeah, silk and bamboo or sp uh, split cane um and the, there is one i think um i think there was one that was done in the, in the shape of a, of a shooting stick so you could use it as a walking stick and then at the right moment you pull pull the thing out and it would pop up as a kite and then you'd fly it. Um, but I hadn't seen the three of them that would, would, would work together. Um, that's quite special. Well, thanks so much, it's fascinating. Uh, just as a small note of connection, my grandmother went to the clergy daughter school in Bristol a hundred years ago or something. And we passed through there, I would have descended upon your kite collection if I'd known your existence. We went through a few years ago on our way to Cardiff when my grandfather was born in Venus Palace. And uh, so that section of England, I, I have some familiarity. And and I know they have kite festivals out there, uh, but I've never been to one. Yeah, yeah, we had a kite festival, but unfortunately that, that finished a few years ago. And so now it's just just local flying on, on the Bristol Downs and <clears throat> And nearby we did have the uh, George Pocock came from Bristol and he was the guy that invented kite bugging and bugging in the 1820s and we've got an original kite in the museum um, actually actually in Bristol um, yeah anyway back to back to Nick is she gone no, sorry, I just muted my mic so that it wasn't uh, overriding what you were saying. <laughs> um, no, uh, by all means, keep sharing, keep sharing the story and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to sign off here in just a second so that uh, I can go grab food and get ready for the five o'clock session with um, with Scott Davis regarding sport kite uh, pairs and teams and his thoughts on flying there. Uh, we're gonna have a little video discussion. But uh, if you were in the previous session, you probably know that I can sign off and you guys can keep chatting. The recording will keep going. And uh, I've had this happen before with the sport kite one, they went seven hours. So there really is no time limit that Paul, if you just wanna keep talking kites, you can do so. Um, otherwise, come join me in the, the sport kite chat. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go grab a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a beer. So awesome job guys. I will uh, see you on the next one. Okay, <laughs> bye. Great, great combination too, uh, peanut butter and beer. It is, it is. <laughs> so see you guys in a bit, <laughs> bye. Well, Paul, let me say that the, every now and then I get an opportunity to do a little presentation about kites and kiting. And I, Donna Houchins was uh, on a second ago. I guess she's just signed off to, to go find the sport kite uh, department. But um, we do talks at uh, little museums and schools and so on. And it really always is the historical stuff that captures people's imagination. You can make these little stories. You know, there are all these little... Sort of historical stories you know i i fly uh, an alec um uh, uh, uh 
what's the name of that uh, kite made by the guy in London who wanted to fly at a high, very steep angle? Alec um, Pearson. On, uh, Pearson, right. Alec Pearson. Pearson. He flew from the round ponds, yeah. Exactly, and and I tell that story about how he flies in these little pocket parks and needed something that could fly far enough away without crossing the street. The that sort of thing really captures people's attention. So there, there ought to be a way to humanize the history, you know, yeah. Alex Pearson's roller, and and how that came from the rollerplan, which rollerplan is German for a Venetian blind. So but, but you know about, you know about Alex Pearson and how he made the kites. He lived, well, in, a, he lived yeah. in a very small house. And he couldn't lay the stuff out on the floor, so he had to paste the the kite fabric on the wall in the hallway, and mark it out on the wall, and then then he could stitch it together. Great story, great story. Hey Paul, I had a question for you. Um, you had mentioned something about uh, a George Pocock. Yeah. Um, is that the same George Pocock that was the boat builder for um, Sculling no, no. Boat? There, there, was a, there was a Pocock who was a, a, um, an artist to see. He did a lot of ship, ship work. George okay. Pocock was a school teacher and he came up with a kite buggy, but he sailed. He also put them on boats. And so they had uh, races out, out on the sea here in Bristol. Um, they, raced okay. them, they raced them from here to Marlborough which is about 40, 50 miles. And his books tell you the account of how it was all done. Um, I've, I've actually been looking for a Pocock kite for years. I haven't found one. But I did manage to find a paper globe that he made. This was in the 1820s. It's um, very, very rare. But it's like a, just after the time of hot air balloons. And um, so I managed to find that. But the, yeah. But he, he he was quite he was quite a nutter actually. Um, <laughs> he, he, he he you you have to understand and read the stories about him to to um, he he was a lay a lay preacher with the Methodists and there's coal mines near here and he would go and spend the summers with the, the coal miners preaching to them because they weren't allowed in the church. Mm -hmm. Apparently, one of the there was a, a story about one of them. He'd had a few beers too many and, and there was a stone fight and somebody got killed and the guy was hanged and apparently George Pocock was going to go up the river with some of the others on a boat and try and get into the prison to get the body and, and get it out. He, he, wow. wasn't, he wasn't just a kite flyer and a school teacher. Um, yeah, so he's, he's a local, um, local hero here. Okay, great. Where do you find these things? You've got all this amazing uh, collection of kites in you. Somebody found a treasure trove of kites behind a wall, but how did it come to you? Um, I think when you've been around for a bit, people sort of gravitate towards you. I don't know. What, I don't know what it is, but um, <clears throat> every now and then something turns up. I think you, you get a sense for for finding stuff, um, and I think I've been I've been very lucky. I was in the airport with me, and that part of it, I was able to get into places that you wouldn't normally do. Um, I was going, doing lectures in the Science Museum all over the place. Um, so you establish yourself, and then people say, oh, well, he must be the guy to go to. So so it works. So people uh, actually bring it to you, people bring things to you. Not exactly bringing, but you get to hear about things. You know, and if, if I do a talk, at a museum, then usually there's two or three people sort of tag on to you, and then you, they say, "Oh, I know somebody," and then it goes on and on from there. But uh, yeah, but it, but it's quite fun. But you, you end up by getting oh, there's so much there's so much stuff. Um, but I've got original Cody kites here. I've got all sorts of French stuff, um, but most of it's sort of around about 1910. And, and earlier, and the books go back to the 1600s. Well, so do you live in an airplane hangar, or where do you find the room to store an organ? <laughs> I just, I just, it just, it's all over the place. Yeah, you can't move. But the good thing with kites is they roll up, and you can pack them flat. You know, you can, um, yeah. And do you have to help you organize it? I mean, I, I, I might have 200 kites and I, and I can barely keep them organized. And I wonder what you must have thousands of them with books and kites. No, I don't, 
<clears throat> no, because some some of the books, um, a book like this, there's another book I've got. You're talking in English money, probably th between three and ten grand for the book. So you don't have that many. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's so it's. Um, but you, the way you do it is you work. work so you don't money because you know what you're doing. I remember coming to the States once and buying George Pocock's book from, um, it was near Washington, D.C. And I bought stuff in China and I'd, I'd, I'd been used to doing some hard bargaining. And it was a very expensive bookshop. But I treated him like a, the guy in the bookshop, like a guy on the street in Beijing. And he was so shocked. <laughs> and I'd, I'd, done, I'd, I'd done my history and I got the book at about, I don't know, 60% of what he was asking. So okay. you, you have to you have to be around. You have to know what the real price is. Um, what what's the most you've ever spent on a item in your collection? Uh, <laughs> um, actually, spent. I, I think I spent um, a couple of grand several times. Um, but then it depends on on what it is. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, it's there's things like this. Yeah, there's this book. There's another one. Um, the authors knew each other. The two earliest books on kites in the English language. Um, the other one I've never seen come up for sale anywhere ever. But a book dealer called me and said he'd got a copy and I paid him for it. So after a while, you get a lot of stuff and then you think, well, the way things work, some things you get cheap, some things you have to pay for. It it, it, it works itself out. Uh, Paul, uh, I'm trying to start building my kite book library. Yeah. And like, there's some books like. Most recently, I've been getting Glenn Davison's uh, different books on how to host workshops, how to make kites. Yeah. Tips and tricks. Um, is there a source online for where you can find more hard to find kite books? Uh, I know there's a lot of books in German and yeah. Chinese and Chinese. One of the, one of the most important for me, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in very old stuff. And the most hmm. important thing for me is to have a good bibliography. And I, I really chase down the bibliographies for books. So I know stuff. I know all the authors. And this is when we're talking about very old things. Um, I've been in the Library of Congress. I used to do do a conference in, in, in Washington, D.C. I go to the Library of Congress and spend a lot of time in there looking through their stuff. And you just build up this knowledge. If it's modern stuff, I know that Glenn Davidson, I don't have any of his stuff. Um, I sort of stopped buying modern books maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, um, it's difficult with the modern book. Um, you use them as resources, and you must you must always question what's inside it. If you've got a book and it tells you how to make a kite, almost invariably the dimensions are wrong, or the materials are wrong, or the technique you want to use isn't consistent with the person writing the book. So you have to you have to think it through. Um, but yeah, but these days. I'm into Japanese woodblock books. I've been buying wood, Japanese woodblocks uh, and then printing from them to make Japanese star kites. Um, but you do what you know. You do what you do. Uh, the good thing about kiting is is that everybody's different. So you you everybody brings something different to the table, and you can say that's fantastic, you know. And then you've done something, and I think that's the great thing about it. Anyway. You're just, you're just you're just got so much knowledge in your experience. It's been great to listen to some of your stories. Yeah, it's there's it's quite a, there's quite a group of people in Europe. Um, there's Jan de Sinclair, uh, Fritz Sove, there's a, a whole lot of Germans, and, and we get together for um, almost like private workshops, and we build up our knowledge base that way. Um, I don't think it works quite the same in the states because I think you're you're also far apart. You can't 
for me, if I wanted to go to Germany, it's an hour and a half flight. But if you want to go from St. Louis to, I don't know, Phoenix, it's two days or something, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I think Europe, we're, we're, we're actually quite close together. It's, it's much easier. Right. Paul, I have a obscure question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. is, uh, yes, because you have an interest also in Asian kites, or you said books anyway, I was curious within your um, research, you have any uh, information relating to the first Asian kite exhibited in England, such as that great exhibition, you know, the Great Crystal Exhibition, or, or other exhibitions that are more cultural or more interesting or Japanese exhibits that came to London, you know, like a hundred years ago or something. So when Asian kites arrive in England, that's kind of my Chinese or Japanese for that matter. Uh, this is any information on that? This is from the, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. And it's a, it's a I, I just saw it just now, it, but it's a Chinese kite from, doesn't tell you. Um, probably the 1880s because they were collecting because of the, the British Empire that people were going out collecting stuff and right, so right. There's, there's huge collections <clears throat> in there but the stuff I, I said to you about the um, in the firework book the firework kite, this one um, there's this one and then there's another kite and they both come from the Cambodia uh, Thailand, Malaysia. It looks like a simple diamond, but with the other kites written by who's a gunner, um, they knew each other. And then I go and talk to the Malaysians and the, and the Thais, Cambodians. You find that these kites were brought back from the northern part of Malaysia, the Khmer uh, region. And that was the of, of, of the UK kites. The Dutch were in Batavia and they brought back different kites. Um, so that's that's when the modern kite came into into Europe. It's around about 1600. Very good. No. But yeah. Any more? <laughs> Somebody else talk. Well, like I said, I appreciate all your information. I look forward to uh, talking to you again sometime. Yeah. Well, there's there's another one tomorrow, isn't there? I do believe so. Yeah. yeah. I was going to... Pardon? There's another um, class, actually. I think she's doing again that just start maybe just started. Yeah, or it's going to be starting here shortly. Yeah. yeah. But if you go over to the the history group on Facebook you'll find a lot of this old stuff being talked about and argued about, particularly between the European people. Um, you say the well, kite is I've got, I've yeah. got the, uh, I've got the, uh, the schedule in front of me, and it's there's a thing on antique kites tomorrow morning, I think, at 8 o'clock Pacific time. Do I have that? Yeah, it's, it's about 5 o'clock for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like eleven for me. It's it's getting on for midnight here. Ah, well, thanks for so much, Paul. That was really very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Paul. Are we going to shut down? Now? <laughs> okay, I've got to have some tea and go to bed. Bye, bye then. Uh, good night now. Good night. Good night.